Hello and welcome to lesson two. This is going to be a PowerPoint on Mesopotamia. I uh, hope everybody found the prehistory lecture informative and I hope the video wasn't too boring. Uh, thank you for those that watched it early and for those of you who didn't watch it early, thank you for watching it even if it was a little bit late. Now, Mesopotamia is what we're going to talk about today, and really I'm going to talk about a couple of different, um, I guess you would call them civilizations that existed in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is going to be also the same thing as the Fertile Crescent. Maybe you've heard of that word before. Uh, Mesopotamia is a Greek word that means the land between two rivers, and we're talking about the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Now the first of these is going to be ancient Sumer, and ancient Sumer existed uh, kind of where the Red Sea and the Euphrates and the Tigris River meet. This would be in southwestern Iraq if you were to look at a map today. Now these are going to be some independent city-states, so it's not one big kingdom or anything like that. But they're going to be independent city-states, and the reason they're considered a civilization is because they have some shared languages, they have some shared beliefs. So they're culturally similar. <clears throat> now, Mesopotamia, this land of ancient Sumer, uh, it's... a unique place because the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, they are fairly unpredictable. They're surrounded by desert, so there's no like natural defenses. There's no trees, there's no mountains, nothing like that. Now, of these independent city-states, there are a couple of city-states that are better known. There's the city of Ur, the city of Uruk the city of Nippur, and all of these cities we think were led by somebody called an Ensi, or a governor. Uh, there's some evidence that they may have been elected by the people, but there's no guarantees of that. They're helped by the Sumerian priests, and the Sumerian priests, they also, in addition to helping the governor, were in charge of religion, as you could guess, but they're also in charge of farming. At the time in ancient Sumer, farming and religion and nature were all very closely related. The priests told everybody when to plant, when to harvest, where to direct the water. Uh, the temples were used as grain elevators. The temples were basically like storage places for all the food. Cuneiform, which I'll talk about here in a moment, was also developed by the priests as a way of keeping records. And what were these records? Business transactions, so that people knew how much food was going into the temple and how much food was coming out. Now, what was cuneiform? It, cuneiform, it's this simple writing system in a way. Basically they're drawing pictures and these pictures are put onto clay tablets. The clay tablets are then put into a fire so that they're preserved and as you can see in the picture here these different pictures represent different things. The cuneiform as you can see, it gets a little more simple as time goes on. For example, you can see a whole triangle in 3000 just goes to a couple of simple lines by the time you get to 600 BC, and that's supposed to represent a woman. Cuneiform, it can be pictographic, meaning that the image actually represents something but it could also be phonographic, meaning the image represents sounds. The Sumerians also had math 
And their math was based on the number 60, as I mentioned last week. And you can still see that a lot in modern day math, you know, 360 degrees in a circle, 60 minutes in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, etc., etc. The Sumerians were very good with ad addition, subtraction, division, and that base 60 math is also really, really good for fractions. Basically practical math, everyday working math. And this math allowed them to build great walls around their cities. It allowed them to build dams, canals, and it kept them relatively safe from warfare. Their laws were all about ethical guidance. Uh, some examples, and yes, you're getting examples of Sumerian law. If a man entered the orchard of another man and was seized there for stealing, he shall pay 10 shekels of silver. In other words, if you're caught stealing, pay for what you stole. Another one, if a man rented an ox and damaged its eye, he shall pay one half of its price. You break it, you buy it. Another one, if a man turned his face away from his first wife, but she has not gone out of the house, his, his wife, whom he married as his favorite, is a second wife. He shall continue to support his first wife. In other words, they make some provisions for divorce, but you have to support and take care of your first wife. Now, Sumerians also have proverbs. Uh, proverbs are supposed to be, you know, stories about ethical guidance. And just a couple of Sumerian proverbs for you to think about. Into an open mouth a fly enters. I like to say that says, think before you speak. A friendship lasts a day, kinship lasts forever. Take care of your family, even if it's not a blood-related family. And don't pick it now, later it will bear fruit. Sometimes it's best to be patient. Now, Sumerian religion is polytheistic, meaning they have multiple gods. And I apparently have a pretty funny spelling mistake there. They, don't, they may have multiple dogs too, but that should really say multiple gods. Uh, some of their gods were An, Ki, Enlil, and Shamesh. Uh, Enlil created mankind from dust and Enlil created mankind to serve the gods, according to Sumerian stories. These gods are sometimes hostile towards humans, sometimes helpful towards humans, sometimes they're about retribution, sometimes they're about success. And the Sumerians use these gods to explain nature. If a god is unhappy, it rains too much. Or if a god is unhappy, it rains not at all. Their temples were called ziggurats, and these ziggurats are going to be like stepped temples. Think of like Aztec temples or Mayan temples, and they were located in the middle of Sumerian gods, and it's thought that rituals were done at the top of the temples. Within the temple, once again, food was stored. The temple is where the priests worked, and Sumerians also had rituals. And sometimes the Sumerians had sacrifice rituals. Now, Babylonians come after the Sumerians. Babylonians exist around 2000 to 1500 BC. They're only around for about 500 years or so. These were thought to be shepherds from north of Mesopotamia, and they were originally called the Amorites, 
And these Amorites begin moving further south into Mesopotamia, and they begin to take over. And before you know it, they've pretty much taken over Sumerian culture. Now, they don't destroy Sumeria. They kind of work their way in, and they take over from the inside. And the Babylonians, they adopt a whole bunch of Sumerian culture. Basically, they take the Sumerian way of life, and they improve it. The best known leader of Sumeria or not Sumeria, but the best-known leader of Babylonia is Hammurabi. And this is supposed to be Hammurabi sitting on his throne right here, if you're curious what the picture is of. And Hammurabi lived around 1700 BC. Hammurabi is going to create a strong, stable empire. And he probably had, if not the first empire, the biggest empire of his day. The Babylonians, they traded with their neighbors. They were very business-like. Uh, they weren't about warfare or anything like that. Now, the Babylonians are best known for their laws. And the law of the Babylonians is known as the Code of Hammurabi. And it's probably the most important legal code of all time because many, many laws after are based on this. Even some of our laws today can be traced back all the way to the Code of Hammurabi. Now the Code of Hammurabi applied to everybody, but one thing that's unique is the punishments for the law changed a little bit depending on your place in life and what you did and what you could afford. So women are treated differently than men. Free people are treated differently from slaves. Nobles are treated differently from commoners, etc., etc. You're going to read the laws this week, and you'll notice that there are tons of provisions in there about retaliation. Death is a frequent punishment. And that's where we get the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Now, it's really important to know that Nowhere in there does it actually truly say an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So um, let me give you a couple examples. If a man has accused a man and cast against him an accusation of murder and has not proved it against him, his accuser shall be put to death. Don't accuse somebody of crime they didn't commit. If a builder has built a house for a man and has not made his work sound so that the house he has made falls down and causes the death of the owner of the house, that builder shall be put to death. If he causes the death of the son of the owner of the house, they shall kill the son of that builder. So if you're building a house and you don't make sure your work is of high quality, you're punished if the owner of that house gets hurt, gets hurt. Now these laws are not necessarily better than Sumerian laws and sometimes they're worse, um, but the Code of Hammurabi covered much, much more than the Sumerian laws and it lasted for a much, much longer time. Also, Hammurabi put pillars with all of his laws written on them throughout his kingdom, so everybody knew what the laws were. Babylonian literature, you've probably read some of this and not even realized it. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh is probably the earliest surviving story. It's a story of a Sumerian king named Gilgamesh and Gilgamesh is worried about immortality. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the gods create a creature named Enkidu. And Enkidu is told to go and fight Gilgamesh, humble him, make him more human. Uh, when Gilgamesh and Enkidu fight, they eventually become best friends. Now, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, they go on different quests, they go on different voyages, journeys, whatever. In the end, Enkidu is going to die. Gilgamesh 
is so distraught he tries to go and find out how to bring him back to life and how to get everlasting life for himself. We also have a scientific creation called the Amasaduga. And I'm probably saying it wrong, but it's okay. The Amasaduga is this series of astronomical observations of the planet Venus. And it records Venus for 21 years. And what's really interesting about this is NASA scientists, after the discovery of the Amasaduga, went back and modeled where Venus would have been back when this was written. And it turns out that the Babylonians were keeping correct astronomical observations. What the Babylonian astronomers were writing was holding up to mathematical evidence from NASA scientists a couple years ago. Now the Babylonians could also solve quadratic equations. So if you're somebody who likes quadratic formula, uh, the Babylonians might be your people. Uh, between quadratic equations and these astronomical observations, there were some serious advances made in science and math. The Babylonians had a very accurate calendar, which of course is important when it comes to agricultural success. Eventually the Babylonians go away and they are replaced by a group called the Assyrians. Now the Assyrians... They'd been around for a while, but it's not until about 1000 BC that they come to dominate. Uh, the Assyrians, they're completely devoted to war. And they're going to hack and slash their way across Mesopotamia. And they're going to take over the area. Now when I say this is a civilization devoted to warfare, everything's devoted to warfare. They, they're sciences for warfare. Like, for example, they could predict solar and lunar eclipses, and then they use solar and lunar eclipses to frighten their enemy and take over. Um, engineering techniques are developed for war. Their main god was the war god named Asher. Their art is based on war. Their literature is based on war. They're going to build chariots, bows and arrows, everything. Even the amount of territory they conquer tells you how warlike they are. Uh, the Assyrians at their largest are going to conquer Egypt, they're going to take over all of Mesopotamia, and they're even going to take over parts of what today would be southern Russia. Now, Assyrian laws, just like everything else, are very warlike and very violent. And this is a tablet of some Assyrian laws. Women were very low status. There were problems of adultery, abortion, uh, rape, homosexual rape, and the penalties are very harsh. Uh, some examples here. If a woman has damaged a man's testicle in a quarrel, they shall cut off one of her fingers. If she has damaged the second testicle in her coral, in the coral, they shall tear out both her ovaries. If a man divorces his wife, if it is his will, he may give her something. If it is not his will, he shall not give her anything, and she shall go out in her emptiness. Here's another one for you. If a woman by her own deed has cast that which is within her womb, and a charge has been brought and proved against her, they shall impale her and bury her not. In other words, if a woman is caught having an abortion, she'll be killed. But there's more to this one. If she dies from casting that which is within her womb, they shall impale her and not bury her. So whether a woman dies or not from an abortion, they're going to kill her anyways. So if you can't tell, these are some very, very harsh, harsh laws. Now the Assyrians, being such a cruel society, 
Uh, there's lots of revolts. There's lots of rebellions. Their enemies hate them. And eventually the Assyrians are going to be overthrown in what we think is probably an internal civil war or an internal rebellion. This rebellion was led by a group of people called the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are sometimes known as the Neo-Babylonians or the New Babylonians. And the leader of the Chaldeans was Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is going to make it his goal to recreate the Babylonian Empire, to kind of undo everything the Assyrians did, and go back to the ways of Hammurabi. So the war god Asher is replaced by Marduk. A new ziggurat is built in the city of Babylon. The Code of Hammurabi is brought back by Nebuchadnezzar. And the Chaldeans are going to end up being pretty wealthy and pretty powerful. Unfortunately, though, the Assyrians, they didn't just do a lot of damage to, like, physical structures. They didn't do a lot of damage and to people physically. They also did a lot of damage to people emotionally and mentally. So even though Nebuchadnezzar is doing his best to recreate the Babylonian Empire, people kind of say, you know, this is too good to be true. Something's going to happen. And so people grew very distrustful and very pessimistic about the world around them. Now, the final Chaldean king, he was known as Belshazzar, he's kind of got an interesting story behind him. Um, Belshazzar and the city of Babylon is going to be attacked by a group of people called the Persians. And when the Persians attack the city of Babylon, Belshazzar thinks that the walls of Babylon are going to protect him. So he doesn't even prepare a defense. In fact, Belshazzar goes and hosts a party for people. Now, because Belshazzar was so busy partying and he didn't really set up a defense, somebody opened the doors, somebody opened the gate to the city, and the Persians take over Babylon without any defense being made. Now, it gets worse from there. Uh, eventually, the Chaldeans are going to rebel and throw the Persians out. And the leader of the Persians, Cyrus, is going to come back. And Babylon is going to resist this new attack temporarily. Persians are going to surround the city, and there's going to be food shortages. So the Babylonians, to try and make the food last longer, lined up and numbered all the women off, one through ten. For every ten women in the city, the first nine were killed, and the tenth one was allowed to live so they could bake bread and cook for the men of Babylon. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen in a healthy society. You can tell by the end of the Neo-Babylonian period, by the end of the Chaldeans, Something was really, really wrong in their society. Eventually, the Chaldeans are going to be defeated by the Persians, and the Persians are going to start a new empire that we're going to talk about in a future lesson. So, for this week, just kind of a quick reminder, uh, what you have to do uh, is your second discussion question or I should say your second set of discussion questions and quiz two. Also make sure that you read those primary sources that are available in the lesson folder. And all your work for this week is going to be due on the 25th by 11.59 p.m. If you have any questions, as always, email me. Either in Blackboard or through your school email and I will do my best to answer those questions as quickly as I can. Until next time, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.